so, uh, so I'm Sumant, uh, Sumant Tambe, um, and um, I work for a company uh, in California called um, Real Time Innovations, and I'm here to talk about a new standard that we are working on. Uh, it, it's been actually finalized, uh, called data an API for data distribution service. That's what this talk is about. So uh, just out of curiosity, so how many people have uh, heard about DDS before you read this program or um, this uh, uh, particular presentation today? Interesting. So um, well, that's why uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce you where, where DDS is really used. You know, why does it really matter? So my, my claim today is going to be uh, that you are, in fact, a DDS user. You possibly couldn't have been here um, for this conference if there was no DDS. For example, uh, DDS is used in air traffic controller systems uh, for airports. Um, DDS has been used and has really strong presence in Navy, in, um, in Air Force, uh, sort of defense applications worldwide, not only in US. DDS has been used in, uh, uh, is being used in healthcare, in cars, in cars these days there are so many processors and so, so much happens at software level that it's, it's, it's really blows your mind away. Uh, air traffic again, um, factory automation controlling these robotic arms, um, tracking locomotives, I know apparently these really big locomotives get lost, I don't know how that happens, but uh, <laughs> they, they do and they want to track, uh, track them, um, cars again. Um, video processing. So there are plenty of applications. Go ahead. That's right. Yeah, that yeah that seems like like kind of a flagship uh, application, a really typical kind of application for DDS. Uh, um, so there is a commonality here. These these applications are uh, uh, you can think of them as smart systems. Without these, life will be just like in stone ages. And what's, what is really important in these systems is the, these systems deal with real world physics. Um, there are timing constraints, real time processing constraints because an aircraft that's, that's landing is not going to stop because you are doing a garbage collection or you know or something like that. The real time constraints are imposed by the environment on the software and software has to work within those, uh, within those kind of uh, bounds. You really cannot stop processing information. Um, a failure in these kind of systems implies really, really bad things. People may die if these systems don't work as expected. It's one thing to lose money if an enterprise system doesn't work or it's down for a few hours, but here we're talking about life. You can think of DDS as a, a I mean, it is a published subscribe middleware. It's a, there's a standard for that, and there are implementers who implement DDS specification. Um, you have some producing applications, for example, streaming data, some sensors, temperature sensors, or even radars, now some events. And then there are some subscribing applications, um, real-time processing, enterprise applications, uh, that those are uh, uh, also possible, and actuators, kind of the robotic arm, like you, you sense something and you respond, uh, uh, in, uh, respond to that. Well, I mean, you've probably seen this architecture before. I'm sure it's just published subscribe. What's new here? The new is the new part is really it's data centric, and I'm going to spend next five minutes on on this slide, trying to convince you that data centric data centric architecture is really uh, kind of really suitable for these kind of applications. So, classic publish subscribe, uh, another way of thinking about it is message centric, uh, is pro you're probably familiar with that. So in message centric middleware, there, is, there are only messages, no concept of a data object. For example, a tweet or a purchase order. It kind of stands on its own. Um, you know a tweet, a tweet is a 140 bytes and that's all. The messages in this particular middleware, right, they are not cached typically by, by the middleware. And what I mean by that is uh, there is some caching for performance reasons, throughput reasons, but that's not visible to the application. Uh, it's not the design goal of these middlewares to have application 
access a, a well-known cache of, you know, well-defined cache of messages. That's just not part of the design. Uh, and I'll compare that how it how it is in data distribution service. Um, yeah, you can have some QoS attached to these messages. Uh, for example, tip QoS is quality of service. I'm not defining that here. I apologize for that. Uh, it's non-functional property um, of of a message or you know of a channel between data writer or between a producer and a consumer. Latency is a non-functional characteristic, but you that's not what I mean here. Um, you don't specify that I want this latency. Latency is a result of your system. Your system. Here I'm talking about some filters, or you, know, you could specify that all messages that are going on on this channel must be persisted in a you know in a database. That's a property you assign to, to that to that data flow for durability, lifespan, or kind of things. In data distribution world, um, DDS specifically, there is a full-fledged data model of applications that are communicating. So here, I have some producers and some consumers, and the data that they communicate, they share, is fully described over here. So, uh, and that data model is nothing but, you can think of them as structs, you can think of them as nested structs, and even inheritance. So those are kind of properties that can be captured in a data model. And these really you these applications depend on that relationship. It's discoverable in a sense. An application here uh, has visibility on okay, what are other different types going on in the network, sort of, and you can discover different topics. I, I'll, I'm kind of maybe jumping ahead of myself here, uh, but um, um, that's the idea. It is, it's a data space, and you kind of operate off the data space. It's not like it's not like send message. It's really you update this data data space with a with a new value, and it's not new really. Uh, data databases actually do this. Data databases, classic relational databases, are a very simple example of data centric. I won't call it middleware data centric system, where data comes first. You first define now well, altitude. This is uh, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, So data comes first, and you, the applications, the behavior comes after that. And that, uh, you know, you, you do that in database design and applications based on that. The messages are actually, in DDS, represent a data object. So the uh, best way to understand that is, uh, is an example. So think of uh, an aircraft, a commercial aircraft, coming to a, uh, an airport. With, when it comes within 10 miles of this airport, this new data object comes to life that this aircraft is kind of around, it's coming towards this airport. And maybe next 10, 15 minutes, it can kind of uh, lives its life, the data object, it lands and then it arrives at the gate. And this data stream, that one data stream kind of vanishes because its useful lifetime is over. Now this, there is a life cycle here clearly. There is a creation of a data stream and there is a expiration, so to speak. DDS has first class features or you know properties to really model that or to to um, uh, to discover that that in a data space there is a new instance of an aircraft available i mean there might be hundreds of aircrafts in air at the same time but is this a new one is this uh, um, you know uh, each each aircraft forms its own kind of independent data stream and you can easily model that and you could do that using a key. It could be simply a GUID, a UID, and that's, that's one way of doing it. The middleware also maintains the state of the object. Now, this is really interesting. An application might be interested in, okay, I want last 10 values of each aircraft. That would be X, Y, and Z, its latitude, longitude, and its altitude of all the aircrafts it has some business with it. So I'm talking about these last 10 values. It could be 100, it could be n, uh, could be different. So these kind of problems come up very often in the smart systems. So middleware has features that it kind of caches this information for the application to be available. 
you, when you read it, you do not kind of remove it from the middleware, it is still there for later use, you know, because as the window shifts, you might be reusing the same data for a while and then it kind of goes out of, out of window. In terms of a quality of service, GDS really has lots of quality of service offerings and for example, reliability, durability, history and we will talk about that. Um, any questions on this so far? Right, could be one, could be thousand. You could, um, I think that that should be possible that um, um, the the consuming applications can be made aware that look, this particular aircraft no longer exists, and whatever that means in the context of application, you know, this logical stream identified by a key has gone away. And that could be very useful meta information for applications to keep track of. One last sort of example, um, the conceptual difference between message centric and uh, data centric. So, you could think of uh, message centric as emails and data centric as the, the outlook calendar. So, imagine you, you get uh, on Monday morning an email, you, you are invited to a meeting on Thursday morning. Okay, you make a mental note of that, you go, go and <coughs> do your work. Tuesday morning, you get another email, the meeting has been moved by an hour. Okay, that means it is Thursday, an hour later. Now, on Wednesday, you get another email, wait, wait, wait. No, it is not on Thursday, it is on Friday, the same time. Now, when Friday actually arrives, you have to think about, well, hold on. I got first message on Monday, it moved one hour, and it is the same time on Friday, that means it must be whatever, you know, 11 o'clock on Friday. So, what what is really happening here is, you are going through this sequence of messages to reconstruct the whole state of where the meeting is supposed to be and when and when you should go. As opposed to that, in case of an outlook calendar, it is like a data space. All you do is just go look up and the meeting moves as per the messages it, it receives. So, when the second message arrives, the meeting goes by next by an hour and uh, next day for the third message. So, it is data centric, the um, outlook calendar is data centric in that sense. All you have to do is just give me the latest update you have about this meeting. You do not have to reconstruct the state. So, that is the conceptual difference here. Uh, is, is, that, is that making sense? That is right. You just ask middleware, tell me about this instance and whatever it knows, it will just tell you. M mind you, that is not the same as, it is not saying that it will be the same across the distributed system. It may not be. It is not like a database, you know, you have a consistent view. It, in fact, DDS is eventually consistent, but that is ok for these kind of systems. I think you had another question. Uh, we can, um, I think the question is, is there less traffic when you use data centric as opposed to message centric? Not necessarily, um, it is really the view of the world. After all, at the consuming side, you need to get that update across. So, it is just how the application, what application does to be aware of that new state. The messages go from here to here, the, the, instead of the application, the middleware does the state construction for you as opposed to the application. But in this specific example, the number of messages will be the same. Although, you could also think of the difference between a message and a data. If you want to send a difference between what, it, what just changed in a data object, right? the plain type, the, the, the make and build, it is Boeing 747, all that stays the same when it lands and when it goes to the gate. So, you do not have to send that information over and over again. All you can send is send the delta. So, that is the difference between a message and data. So, message is not the same as data, because 
message is delta and you apply it to what you know already and that becomes your data. Uh, does that make sense? Um, uh, the question is, if the middleware is uh, keeping the history, then there should be some monitoring. Well, um, I don't know, let me try to answer it this way. It is not, the history is not unbounded. You specify some other quality of service properties, so that the history does not grow unbounded, because that just would not work, you know. So, I am not sure, that is what you meant by monitoring or If I can paraphrase your comment, um, in message centric systems, you need an external entity to keep keep the, the state. Hmm. Um, maybe we can talk about this a little later. I am having. Uh, I have to go through lots of slides. We haven't even talk, started talking about C++ yet, but sure, uh, let, let's talk about it later. Um, so that's the conceptual difference, and the API actually will reflect this this philosophy, and that's why it's important to really uh, make sure that uh, you know I, I get, make it I get it across. So DDS is actually a family of standards. The DDS, the the system properties, and you know um, these uh, uh, the conceptual model was standardized in 2004. It doesn't talk about the API. I mean. There is a, does not talk about a language specific API, I um, will talk about it in a second. There is also a interoperability specification. So, a DDS application working on one vendor's implementation works just fine with another application working on a different vendor's application. You are talking about APIs, uh, API compatibility, so it is not only portable, but it is also interoperable at the wire level they know what you are talking about. So, this has been also been standardized and it is really important particularly uh, defense world. There is UML profile, there is some CORBA component model stuff, there are some um, type description lang type description facility, this is what uh, uh, defines the, uh, the data model that is in the data space. And here is what uh, we are going to talk about today. Um, there are two, two APIs defined. Um, for two languages, one is C++, uh, particularly C++03, there are some C++11 you know, sort of uh, provisions in it and also for Java. Uh, there is ongoing work on security, there is also RPC or DDS, if you want to know what, what those are, uh, come back uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, so, I am um, going to show you different examples. So, here is kind of a vocabulary. This is, I guess, the last slide, last kind of background slide before we jump into examples and real code. Uh, he, he, here is a sort of the vocabulary for uh, what's what's in a DDS system. You know, how do you create one? Uh, you know, an application uh, that that talks over distributed uh, over, over a network. So a domain participant, you can think of it as a process. It doesn't have to be really. You can have more than one domain participant in a process, but for our discussion, this is sufficient. This is like a like a process and two processes separated by by a network. A data you need a data writer, this is a public publishing application, or maybe I should say producing application, and it talks to a data reader on the other side, and both of them use a type called foo. It could be user defined type, some foo. There are there is a topic and that is bound to this particular foo type, and you have to use this topic. Okay, I'm I'm interested in whatever is being said on this topic, I know that is foo. So, that is the way you kind of latch on to this topic. There are publishers uh, that contain data writers and subscribers that contain data readers, just kind of a uh, parent parental relationship. There is offered and requested QoS. Now, this is interesting. The data reader offers requests some QoS, quality of service. I will show you an example in the next slide and data writer offers something. So, middleware actually looks at both of them and tries to see if does it make sense for these two guys to talk talk to each other. If data writer is offering 
equivalent or stronger quality of service, then it, it they will talk, otherwise they won't. And there are there is a callback based mechanism uh, to read data or read some system notifications, you know what is really happening in the system. Well, I think I had a, another slide in here, or oh, maybe it is coming afterwards, okay, all right. So, why are we really talking about, why do we need a new API? The main reason is the, the classic way in which DDS, DDS has been defined in, the, in 2004 was UML model and there is a interface definition language equivalent API for that, for creating publishers, subscribers, data readers, writers kind of things. And there are well known mappings from IDL to these languages, there are many more languages. The problem is that IDL is being a kind of a common denominator for all languages, does not recognize very powerful C++ or even other language features, for example, overloaded operators, static functions, templates, exception safety. You know, in case of uh, um, standard library, it does not know what, uh, what STL is, it does not know standard string. So, as a result of that, what happens is the, the old mappings, due to use of old mappings, the API you get to use DDS uh, becomes really kind of, uh, uh, how do you say this, um, sort, of, sort of old fashioned, you cannot use really STL, it is not STL friendly, it feels foreign, it does not feel at home for a, for a modern C++ program and we want to fix that and that is why we are talking about this standard. Question? Uh, I think, no, it is not the same, but it is similar enough to be confusing. Right. It does, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Right. So, the comment is there is a new ideal to C++ 11 binding, uh, which, which is, which will be one more arrow here. That can be used, but the result of that is still not what you want. You will see there are so many C++ specific, it is a, uh, it is a design using C++ features that you do not derive even if you use ultra modern mappings, because after all your starting point is ideal and you will see some examples. For example, operator overloading, there is just no way to describe that here, you are not going to get that in C++ 11 mapping automatically. So, that is why we created this standard, um, we want an intuitive API, very easy to learn, easy to understand, it should be efficient, a very important requirement, it should be portable. It should be portable to the extent that it should be just sort of uh, um, drop in replacement of vendor implementation. So, you just uh, change the header path, change the libraries, your application compiles. That is the goal um, uh, and barring some extend extensions that each vendor provides, I think that's, that is that's been achieved. So, this API also allows extensions and that th there are business reasons for that. We do not want to implement, if all the vendor implementations are exactly the same, then there is really no value add that each vendor provides. What we really want to do is, a big chunk of the standard is implemented by different vendors and then there is, there are their own value add which those are extensions. So, this is well understood and that is why there is a sort of standard way of providing extensions. Of course, it kills portability, but um, that that is really the business reason behind having it. Um, this is the really the makeup of different companies that worked on this standard. Um, it was finalized end of last year, December, December 2012. So, other than RTI, uh, there were several other companies and it is a object management, management group standard. Okay, code, finally. So, with all that background, let us look at uh, how, uh, you know, how to write a really simple hello world DDS application using the new PRISM, the new platform specific mapping. 
and maybe I didn't describe that. But the platform here is C++, and it's a C++ specific mapping. Java that would be another one. So you create a domain participant. Well, first of all, there is a class track. I'll get to it. What that is, where that's coming from. You create a domain participant. You create a topic, and you say it's really about tracks. Those tracks could be, you know, given by radar or you know whatnot. You specify a name for that. You create a publisher. Let's not go into details of why you need that. Now, before creating it a writer, you, s you want to specify some quality of service. What are the kind of guarantees this, this data writer is providing you? It says, OK, I'll, I'll write this data reliably. I can, I can talk to you reliably. That means I will not drop any samples or uh, anything like that. But I will keep only last 10 samples with me, no more. And durability is another QoS policy. Uh, I, I don't think that's really important for this particular discussion. But it says, OK, I'll be transient local. So um, uh, yeah, le let me just skip that. So now you create a data writer using, OK, this publisher, this topic, and this better match, this track, and the, this QoS. There you have it. You create a data writer, and that's kind of ready to start talking to whoever is out there uh, consuming applications. You create an object of track. In this case, it's a tank type, and you know maybe its uh, its ID is dead. You know whatever, uh, some some data. And you write that. The key thing is this is not send message. You are sort of making this information available out there that I know about this tank, this specific tank. It's an ID. That. You can have more information, of course, its location, sort of, and you kind of write it to the data space. Now, whoever reads on the other side will get it, but it's not a send message. It, the, the, the name is purposefully like that. Mm -hmm. Sort of, yeah. When you, when you write this, if this happens to be a new ID, the middleware will recognize that, that now this data writer is talking about uh, a previously unknown tank. That means, let me publish first of all, that there is something new, and here is data about it. And then there are APIs to say, I'm done talking about this guy. You know, uh, So that's, that's again meta information that goes across network. A very good question. Only track, only track. Yeah, the IDs are scoped uh, within within a type. You don't have to have an ID, but in most cases in DDS you do because you want to distinguish between these sort of logical streams. Um. So the question is, is it important? Is it? Do I have to make sure that I'm the only writer about? this particular tank? The answer is no. In fact, for redundancy, you could have multiple data writers writing about the same instances. It's up to the reader to really, in fact, the middleware doesn't care. There, are, there is a QoS, I'll talk about it. The, for reader, there might be redundant updates. But that's maybe OK, you know, uh, that uh, this tank kind of moved a mile, then another mile, another mile. You get those updates redundantly. That's that's probably okay because there is no behavior attached to this message. It's just here is the state of the world. Here is the state of the world again. Here is the state of the world again. You get it multiple times. That's maybe okay. It's not like you know I don't know destroy tank, destroy tank. Not have you know having that multiple times would probably not a good idea. But the key difference is. You are attaching a behavior with that message, you know, destroy or you know something. This is just about. This is what I know, kind of. Does, does that answer your question? If you use a specific QoS called ownership, the writer says, "Okay, I'm kind of a big boss here. My ownership is hundred. Your ownership, your other writer, you are ten. Then the then the reader can say." I want to read data from whoever is the boss. And there you have it. Then the middleware will say, OK, I'm going to throw away what this guy says. But later on, you could, in fact, bump up its uh, ownership 
strength to 200 and suddenly the data reader will switch its uh, source. And here is data reader, uh, pretty some boilerplate code at the beginning. Let me jump to the QoS part. And here it is saying, well, it is okay if you do not talk to me reliably. I am sort of best effort reader. As long as you keep last 5, I am happy with you. And this is the same. Now, these QoS are not exactly the same, but the writer is offering stronger guarantees than, than what this guy needs, so they can talk. The middleware says, okay, you are good to go. Now, you create it a reader, just like uh, the reader writer, and you read, and you get some data, uh, whatever is available, and you can use some classic STL um, algorithms to, uh, to do something with it. Now, this would not have been possible before uh, uh, in the earlier, earlier kind of old binding. Uh, again, these overlaid operators, they are kind sort of, uh, I do not know, uh, con, con, they are confront, I do what is the right word. Not everybody likes those, but uh, I like those. I mean, these are, uh, that, that kind of reads really well in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. So it's some ideal that's right, and that's my. I think that's my next slide. Here you go. Okay. So, here is the well. I call it a radar track here, but it's it's track. Uh, so this is how you describe. This is IDL. This is not C plus plus. And okay, it has an ID, latitude, longitude, altitude, and some some sequence, some metadata with it. From this, you generate some C plus plus type that kind of captures the the you know the provides the necessary uh, setters and getters uh, based on the names here. And the implementation of this class is up to the implementer. All standard specifies is what should be the API, now how not how it should be implemented. You could have just a pointer and have a C struct or you could have all the strings and everything spelled out in this class. It is up to you. It is up to the implementer. So, there are several QoS. I am not going to go into details of this. Of course, the, the standard recognizes that beyond just standard QoS, there are two kinds of extensibility that, was, that is required. First is, uh, for example, even RTI provides some extensions for these standard QoS policies. There are certain members in some of these QoS policies that are non-standard. And then there are certain more QoS policies that are nowhere to be found in the standard. For example, reliability. In case of RTI, we provide additional member called max blocking time. Another one is acknowledgement kind. These are not specified in the standard. We want to keep them there because they are really useful. They are there for a reason. But what standard does is provides a, a, a compliant way to access those. So now, if you look at source code, you can see, and it's just actually an arrow operator. You know, it's an overloaded arrow operator. For extensions, you have to use arrow operator. For standard defined things, you have to use the dot operator. So dot really allows you to have the interface in standard defined headers. Arrow allows you to kind of escape to some totally different pointer, which is generally, um, you know, um, implementation defined, and there could be any any number of additional. Uh, extensions. And, uh, other than that, there are certain uh, QoS in, uh, on top of that. For example, you know, thread pool, batching kind of properties. So how do you how do you specify these? You know, or how in standard wants to specify a, a framework to really specify this. The way we do that is using templates. Pretty straightforward template code compared to uh, all the different talks going on in uh, you know, this week actually. Really, I mean, this is like uh, no-brainer templates. So these are the setters, these are getters, and uh, this is standard specified class. And it says, okay, if you have some policy type which I don't know, that's a template, and it could be arbitrary policy. The implementation of this, it kind of forwards it, kind of delegates it to the um, yeah over here. There is a delegate type, which is uh, implementation defined. 
So, if there is a policy that uh, not supported in the standard interface, it implicitly needs to go to um, uh, to the underlying delegate, which needs to understand what, what that is. So, these are sort of new types, you know, for example, batching. You can have an object of type batching. Well, I do not think I have a good example here. These are really standard types, um, policies, but I, I think you get the idea here. So, uh, you could also read the data kind of back from QoS in H object. This, this gets populated and, uh, and you can also read deadline if you want. You can chain these. You could have some extension also. It will just go blend right in, but that is an extension now. Or you could use other policy objects also. Um, it kind of gives, uh, you know, consistency as well as a well-defined way of adding extensions because if different vendors come up with really radical ideas of having extensions because you can do certain things in so many ways in C++, we kind of restrict that here. All right. So, uh, now we are talking about, you know, uh, how the, the, this philosophy of data centric architecture kind of influences the read, read and take API. So, first of all, there are two things in DDS, read and take. There are two different things. Read means, well, I want to access this data, but do not delete this from your buffers. I may need it again. And take is more like you are probably familiar with, you just take it once and it is gone. You just, you have it with you. Clearly, if you keep doing just read, the buffers will grow, because you are really not clearing the buffer space. But then there are other QoS policies, for example, um, resource limits that will limit how, how far it will grow. The interesting thing is what you read and how you read. Let me, let me emphasize what I mean by that. So, in case of data centric kind of mindset, uh, let me just look at these red um, sentences and that those should kind of, uh, kind of give you the semantic differences. Have I read this sample before? You know, first of all, there is, there is read which does not clear the buffer. So, you might want to know first of all, is this new data first of all or is this something I have read before? And middleware can tell you, hey, yeah, you actually read this before. So, uh, that is that. So, what is the state of the sample? Now, this is something I think we already talked about. Is this a new tank or is this something I, I knew already? The middleware can provide that information too. That you are really looking at a new tank and do so, if you want to do something about it, do that. Now, you can also test if is there anybody out there who is still talking about this specific tank or specific aircraft. You, I mean, these are kind of conceptual questions. I am not going to show you the gory details of using API to do that. Actually, it is reasonably straightforward. But uh, I want to give you the mindset, the kind of queries uh, uh, the, the API allows you to do. Um, over here, you can actually pass a full fledged expression which looks like a SQL expression. Give me all the data um, about uh, tanks that are that are within I do not know maybe 10 miles of this latitude and longitude x and y. So, you, you form this query and because the data is cached in the middleware, it is just like a you could think of it as a database query, but it is there, there is no persistence here the, all data is in memory. So, this is kind of kind of questions you want to ask when you develop your systems, but how do we do that? So, here is an API for uh, uh, read and take. This is what, um, this is how you read it. For example, here now you return some loan samples, those are basically buffers to the underlying middleware. These are forward, forward iterators, these are ba back inserting iterators. So, this is how you read it. This still does not specify what you want to read you know, those, uh, um, uh, those query kind of operations. So, to capture that, wow, oh, what just happened? I think I ran out of battery or something? No. Wow. No, I, actually my computer rebooted. Maybe it is, uh, it is, uh, I do not know, it is just decided to go to, I hope not. I hope not. Starting Windows, I really apologize for that. Uh, well, um, 
maybe we could still talk about it, you know. So, um, what we want to achieve is, you know, separate how you read from what you read. So, you specify what you want to read using, you form a query object, we do that using selector. So, the earlier questions or the sentences I showed, there is an API to kind of form this state, okay. I want to use this query and I, use, I want to use this specific instance, uh, for instance, you know, this specific ID. Um, you can now build up that state. you know what you want to read and then you kind of pass it on to one of these read or take calls. Okay. Here is what I want to read and this is how I want to read. Okay. Push it back, use push back on a vector or maybe uh, uh, fill in this range using forward iterator or simply give me pointers to the underlying buffers. So, those are kind of different ways of accessing the data. Question? Absolutely. That's right. Uh, the to paraphrase your comment, the middleware is tracking the transactions that are going on between the client and the middleware regarding what data has been read or not, and answer is yes clearly between successive function calls, that is obviously there. Across the life cycle of the reader, if this, you know, this reader completely goes away, the process shuts down, comes back up. Now, you are talking about some, you have to specify some QoS objects now, some QoS policies. For example, one would be um, durability and in that case you say, well, um, first of all and also history. So, you could say, okay, I want to read last 10 values of, on, on this channel, um, provided its durability is uh, transient local. In that case, you won't get anything till it has filled in its cache. The middleware kind of waits for to get the latest 10 samples and then read, suc read succeeds. So, um, there are more details to it, but that is the basic idea. But you, you got it perfectly that uh, that is how it is supposed to do. Uh, this is going to take, uh, this is really embarrassing. <laughs> okay, getting there. So, that is the main difference. So, the way we achieve that is using a very simple C++ technique. Uh, you return for a selector, you kind of build the state want to achieve this using method chaining, you kind of uh, uh, call the same fun different functions on the same object, you achieve that using um, returning the same object over and over. So, here the instance remembers the handle and returns itself, the content sets this, returns itself. So, you build this state and I think this helps readability quite a bit. The main use of this is you do not have to have n multiplied by m combinations. There are different combinations here, different you know how and uh, what you want to read. So, uh, I think this is just what I uh, explained. Uh, instance returns the same object over and over. So, you can kind of uh, uh, chain the, those methods one after another is the same object you are modifying. So, you can you, you can actually you need only n plus m combinations as opposed to n multiplied by m. If you did not do this, you would have multiple functions with different parameters with max samples, with instance handle, with query, with without query you see what, what I am saying. So, that is the reason. Uh, so, this particular simple C++ feature helps us uh, design you know separate what and how in a kind of a very readable neat fashion. I thought you have had a question. Um, that is right, yeah. So, there is only 
one history per per topic per instance for a data yeah the question is uh, um, if there are multiple data writers right the question is uh, how can middleware is there a facility to specify that don't repeat what you already told me although keep it around one way to do that is take just take it out that's one simple way if you do read it is also a way uh, in particular uh, that would be uh, sample state actually you specify sample state that being uh, not read in this uh, function it, it's not really well it, it, yeah actually this example does that so state what i'm interested in is i want new data only that i, I haven't read at all so it will keep the data around but it will only specific it will only return you data that is you are interested in and you know this application thread may be interested in new data some other application thread may be interested in everything old as well as new they are sharing the same beta reader that that works just fine all right the listener so in dds there are listeners first of all to read data you can it's a callback based mechanism you just get data in a, in your callback um, or you, you get a notification that there is data available on this reader and then you do a, do a read uh, the way i showed earlier or uh, you can also get some system notifications so those are sort of okay um, did i just miss my deadline or you know in case of writer uh, did i di am i really doing what i'm supposed to do i should be writing data every so often you know periodically in case of data reader um, uh, did, did the offered deadline missed you know uh, what, what really happened uh, if that happens i want to know that it actually happened it's kind of system level notification did liveliness of the other side change this writer i was kind of dependent i am dependent on is no longer alive maybe it failed or something happened i want to know about that if that happens so these are kind of api callbacks you can implement and respond to that in dds these are standards based you know this kind of systemic issues come up very often because reliability is very important in these systems and there are about five or six in uh, data reader so the way the way we model this is okay listener is a base interface and these are sort of uh, sort of worker listener instances here in fact interfaces the the methods are defined here methods are defined here and this is kind of your first first line of defense against uh, you know um, some some system notifications and you can you may want to have different behavior based on what type and topic you are uh, you know uh, dealing with if you are ta talking about some foo topic some chat then maybe it's okay if you miss a deadline or if you missed uh, uh, the the other guy is no longer alive if you are talking about a topic nuclear missile then maybe not maybe you really want to do something really quickly if you missed a deadline in case of that you know so so there is a sort of escalation process if at this kind of worker level or first line of defense really cannot do much for you you sort of escalate this to your bosses or all the way to to ceo here the domain participant that do something about it you know i don't know i i the the liveliness change i don't know what to do this is one convenient place to sort of uh, uh, it's a catch all for different system notifications so these interfaces inherit from these interfaces the intention is the concrete instantiation would uh, would take care of the system notifications in the system however these are typed these are actually modeled as uh, the, the, they take template types because it's a for example for data reader it's reading data of what kind and that's why it's a template but these guys are not now uh, we'll come back to it in a, in a second so these are untyped these are kind of generic actions so uh, here is the api i don't if, if it's okay it's okay if you don't can read this um, if you can read this that's that's great so here is a data writer listener which is type it's a template 
and you have these virtual methods, okay, deadline missed, uh, incompatible QoS, and so on and so forth. You, you, you should implement those uh, if you are interested in these callbacks. And here is the the writer on which you know sort of the the event happened. So you get that uh, data pointer or you know, you know some some handle. The the problem arises. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Question. Um, well, uh, it is a matter of having an, having an adapter class, which kind of provides empty implementations of this. And I think in the new standard, those are called no op listeners. So, there is a no op data writer listener, you inherit from that, you get empty bodies for all of them, just like adapter pattern in, in Java. So, the question is, there is a C++ issue lying here. The, the escalation classes really do not have information about type. I mean, you cannot really without, you have to implement this exact function in the derived class, but it is, there is no type information there, there is no T. So, how would you implement this function if you do not know what T is in case of, uh, in case of these guys? That is the problem we face, you know. We still want to keep type here, because you can do type specific actions, right? Whether it is a missile or it is a, it's a chat, it is different, the severity is different, but here um, there is no information. Well, okay, I showed you an animation a second before, uh, anyway. So, I have a little animation for you. What we do is, we replace the sort of this first line of defense, you know, the, the worker interfaces by any equivalent. It is similar to, it is actually type erasure, uh, just like in boost any or uh, um, I think even iterator, uh, any iterator uh, library. So, once you have any, you kind of erase the type and I will show you how, how that happens. These more uh, least specific classes can actually implement that. The type is hidden behind the any listeners, but you can still access it provided you know the ID and so on and so forth. You can, you can do some, some runtime lookup based on IDs and do the right casting using any. Um, I think looking at code would be much easier. Um, the any data writer in this particular case provides some API that is independent of types. All data writers can provide this information. In case of readers, there is similar, but you cannot read data because data is typed. You cannot read unless you know the type. So you really have to cast before uh, before you can use this to read and write. Um, so the type is erased. So the way we want to we want to implement this is we want to hide the type for momentarily, but keep it keep it uh, there. Actually, you don't want to forget it at all um, altogether. So, the way we do this is really classic type erasure implementation. Uh, if you are really familiar with it, I can probably skip this. If you want me to go through uh, how it is done, um, it should not take too long. So, an any data writer is not a template, but the constructor is. And you pass in any data writer, now that this any is different any, a, let me say a. Uh, you pass in a data writer of some type and you create a sort of um, a placeholder for this data writer. I am going to show you this class in a, in a moment. So, the data writer holder is templatized. So, it knows its concrete type, but it is inheriting from data writer holder base, which is not a template. And here you have the base pointer only. So, by means of you know polymorphic uh, assignment, you create a derived object here and you put it inside the, the base pointer, as simple as that. To get the original type back though, you have to specify the type and you, you do dynamic cast in this particular case, uh, because you know, I mean you, you better be right in this case, otherwise dynamic cast will fail and you will get a null pointer, but that is okay. Um, you have to keep track of types, because you just erased it, you need to, to, to get back, you should specify the right one. So, the implementation of uh, the, the placeholder is pretty straightforward. 
you know, these are sort of type independent operations and inside the holder is simply a, a copy. In fact, this is a, um, these are reference types. So, it is really not making a copy of data writer, it is just a reference like a shared pointer and you keep this, this around and uh, you get kind of type erase data writers. And because of that, you can now inherit. So, this particular functions instead of taking a type data writer, now takes any data writer, there is no type information there in statically. And this guy is just happy because all you get is any data writer. Uh, does that make sense how, how we uh, use the uh, type eraser in this context? All right, uh, moving along. So, the next topic I want to touch upon is uh, exception safety. This is kind of really interesting, um, uh, really in interesting in my opinion. So, because we are specifying an API and being a C++ uh, enthusiast, I really want to ask myself, is this exception safe? I mean, what are exception safety guarantees? And if you step back, it is actually really important for portability. I think exception safety is a, is a contract that can affect portability in, a, in major ways. If the specification cannot specify um, whether it is basic exception safe, a strong exception safe, when you, when you do actually port your application from one vendor to another, you may or may not have those guarantees and that means your application behavior is suddenly different in case of exceptions. So, and you probably do not want that to happen because exceptions in a smart system kind of critical system is a very important, you know you do not just hand wave in case of exceptions because something bad is happening, there is, there is life at stake, you really want some, some guarantee what is really going to happen. So, this does not happen so often, but it is important to specify what will happen. Well, um, so let us look at read and in this particular case, I am using back inserting iterator. So, you, this particular function will push back the data that you are interested in into a vector or list whatever you have. Clearly, it can fail in two places the copy assignment operator of the data that you are copying can throw because this is, this is growing the uh, and, and the next one is pushback, pushback may throw because the container may grow, may need to uh, you know uh, allocate more capacity as it is growing and that operation may fail. So, now you are talking about two things actually, exception safety not only for the application, but also for middleware. So, first of all, what happens to the, the standard vector that was passed to this read? What happened to its old data? Is it all gone? Is it corrupt? Half of it is good, half of it is not. That is weird. But also at the middleware perspective. So, you, you read this data, now you are copying this into your data structure. What does it mean? Did you read it? Did you finish reading it? Uh, you know, back, going back to your question, does it remember? whether you finish reading or not, you know uh, the next time around what should I do? Well, well, you failed while copying, but really you did access it. So, there are some really thorny issues to um, that we you know encounter in this particular case. The, the key point here is there are, there is a, there are two perspectives, what happens in application, what happens for application containers, what happens to the middleware, that is the key point I want to uh, get across. So, I have a little graphic for you to show, um, but a bit of background before why this is important. So, again this standard recognizes that, uh, thank you, the underlying implementation may not be C++. In fact, this is just supposed, not supposed to be, you could implement entire DDS using C++, C++ 11 if you want to, but that would be humongous task and as vendors we do not want to do that. This is just a layer and that is the typical approach most vendors will take on top of a C 
implementation of the of the middleware. It could be C++, does not have to be C, but the key point is there is existing investment in the implementation, which we just want to reuse, um, add a layer on top and there you go. You, the, from top for the application, it looks like you get the API, I mean, this classic adapter, right? classic facades. So, for this C layer, when you read something, as far as the middleware is concerned, this is really the middleware boundary and everything above is really the application for, for this guy. Well, you are right, there is, a, there is a layer here, which is technically conceptually still part of the middleware, but not for, not for this layer. You know, it, it has been developed, it has been it's mature for years. So, let us see what happens when you, when you do this. So, you are running read, you get pointers to the underlying buffers and you copy them. So, you get, get it from the first, first layer back and as far as the middleware is concerned, the data has been read because this operation succeeded and the middleware marks this data as read. You know? So, read a kind of counterintuitive is, is a destructive operation, it changes state, read changes state because you are marking not read to read. So, that is what middleware is doing here, okay, I am done, all side effects of this operation are complete, you read this successful, uh, you know great, but there is more coming. The application has not received data yet, this interface is kind of old style uh, API which you do not like, that is why there is this API. Now, it is time, our time to you know, kind of copy this back into a vector, or you are doing push back one by one. Well, you kind of push back maybe first few, you are an exception here for whatever reason, the vector through an exception, maybe the copy through an exception. Now, what do I do? Uh, according to the middleware, you have finished reading it, but the application it is clearly wrong, right? The application has not read it, the data is kind of stuck in the middle application kind of forgot, uh, you know, what happened to it, it does not care what happened to layers above. So, what do you do? You could roll back, you could ask the middleware, well, I could not really copy this, take this back, take this back, you know, kind of roll back, but roll back would require, it is kind of a transaction now, this whole thing needs to go in a transaction and that means, you are really constraining the concurrency in it, because while you are doing this, there could be another thread that is just sitting duck, because you are copying data here, that is not what we want. So, it will really reduce concurrency, this has to happen atomically, if you if you want rollback semantics. It is really not, that is not the problem here, actually the problem is about, you know how, it is really not exception safe, the API is not exception safe, that is the, that is the problem. And so, is there another way to uh, around it, you know, that is the question. Well, uh, so let us consider some alternatives, let us not use iterators, just go back to the plain old kind of you know uh, pointers to the underlying buffers. Well, that is the, the reason why we started doing all this stuff was to get kind of new, new style API, um, kind of uh, you know friendly C++ friendly style of using it. So, well, that is really not, not an option, because otherwise everything is moot. Now, let us consider if we could use RAII, because this is a kind of resource management question. How about we create a samples class that keeps the, uh, keeps the, you know, the middleware buffers with itself. It is a resource, it is kind of a, um, it is a resource that you keep around and when the samples go out of scope, you will return. It is just classic RAII pattern. Well, this function is actually returning it, that means you better have a copy constructor and assignment operator now, because the destructor is going to return those back to the, back to the middleware, it is done, because it is doing buffer pooling, you know buffer pooling is really important, because we want efficiency, uh, we really cannot allocate, we want to reduce allocation as much as possible during this fast path, you know, read will be called very often, we really do not want to pay cost of allocation every time we call read or take. So, can you do copy assign? Well, yes, you can do that, but every time you read, that means there will be a copy made over here, 
and that copy will be allocated because that's how RAI will work in a resource management class. Um, so you don't want that either. Remember, um, this goes back to you know, it's not only efficiency reason; it could be just wrong because the samples copy constructor could throw, that means you are back to the same problem. It is no different from why stack has two operations, one is top, another pop. If pop return the object and the copy constructor true, then you really lost uh, the top of the, the stack, but the application does not have it. So, that is the same problem here. So, that is why it has been divided into two but this operation, this particular uh, example does not work here. We have better solution than that. Uh, does that make sense why, why this analogy kind of applies here in case of exceptions? Because right at the boundary of the function you could throw, so you do not even know whose fault that is. Is it the function that is at fault? Is it the samples? Is it the caller? What is really happening? Basically, this is also not exception set and the same reasoning goes on that. Well, uh, let us see if we could use shared pointers, right. Uh, uh, once we create the shared pointer, you can just pass them along freely. There, there is very little, there is no risk at all of exceptions once a shared pointer is formed, right. It does allocation at the beginning, but not later on. So, we read at the beginning here and we provided we have some data, we allocate a shared pointer and return that. Well, I am using shared samples, it is kind of, a, I think of it as a shared pointer really, but re more tailored towards DDS. Uh, internally, it uses shared point to think of it that way. Well, the problem here is it is no different from the earlier case. The shared pointer allocation could fail because it internally it allocates a uh, reference count. Now, that could fail is the same problem, it is just that uh, it is inside read. You could, in fact, do some cleverness here in, in, in cases if it fails, you could roll back, but it is really not the the point here, that is it's the same problem we are, we are encountering. So, how about uh, actually this particular code violates the, the basic rules of exception safety, have all the code that may throw at the beginning and everything that does not is guaranteed to succeed towards the end. So, let us do that. So, let us first of all, the first thing we do in read is allocate a pointer. So, that if that fails, we do not read, life is good you know, middle, there is no confusion about what happens in the middleware, you just get an exception back. But the problem here is, in most cases this solution would suffice, but not in DDS. Read, each read does an allocation now. It is bad for two reasons. First of all, we do not want allocation and second, you may not have anything to read at all. It does not say anywhere in DDS uh, specification that every call to read will have some data. You could just get empty set, you know, that is all. There is nothing for you right now, because the way you selected what you want, you could just get empty. That is not uncommon at all. So, you just paid a heavy cost for just to find out there is nothing for me. So, seems like um, um, even this solution is quite suboptimal for, uh, for our case. Uh, does that make, make sense so far? So, what we ended up doing was uh, we introduced Moo semantics, we use Moo semantics in C++ 03 by the way uh, to get uh, what we really want. So, we introduced a class called loan samples, it is basically uh, a wrapper, an RAII style wrapper around these middleware buffers, pre allocated buffers to get data in from inside layers to outside and still keep the, the look and feel of modern C++. That means uh, iterators and RAII and stuff like that. Loan samples does not do sharing. It only moves data from right hand side to left hand side. And that means, when you return a loan samples object as, as by value, you are really taking the resources, stealing the resources away from the call, from the callee, from the inside function to the caller. It kind of moves them. It is no different from shared pointer actually but it is safer than that. I will get to that. Not a shared pointer, uh, I am sorry, uh, auto pointer in C++ 03. So, RAII is still applicable. So, 
when the last reference to when the last lone samples object goes out of scope, the, the buffer is written back to the middleware, just like in case of exceptions that will happen automatically, but you do not pay a cost of copying. And the way it happens is because of move semantics. It has an internal resource that gets moved. So, instead of uh, just um, let us just jump into code and see how, how that actually works. So, here fortunately it fits in one slide. It is very interesting and you know kind of powerful feature, pretty simple to understand, uses kind of nice C++ um, you know corner cases, uh, but you know kind of works really nicely. So, first of all it is a template and inside that you have a proxy class, a really simple class just to just meant for sort of transport, really no um, meaning attached to it. And you have a copy constructor and a copy assignment operator that is private. And by the way, this this is a copy constructor, although it does not have const, it is still copy constructor as per the language rules. In fact, if you add any const qualified, CV qualified stuff here, it will be still a copy constructor. And that is private, so clearly we do not want compiler to use that and it is just a declaration, no definition required. So, when you actually, let us take one example, when you return, let us take an assignment of one loan samples to another. This one is private. So, if you have, maybe I have an example afterwards, yes precisely. Let us take this example. You have a named loan samples object that you want to assign here, that is not going to work. To make this compile, the compiler will look, look up this function and will say sorry that is private, cannot can't, can't use it. But if you add this, a move, then compiler is happy. What move does, just one line at the bottom here, it turns this named object into a, a temporary object here. The details of this we are going to see uh, why, why this, uh, why this, what this one line of code does. So, now this is a temporary and here you are now assigning a temporary to left hand side. Compiler tries to see if there is a set of conversions that can be used to achieve that and there is in fact, that is what is happening here. The first thing it does, it recognizes well, if I somehow get this proxy T, then I can kind of do this assignment, well actually this particular one, but how do I get proxy T? Well, it looks at it here, well I can convert a loan samples into a proxy and I will just call this, I will just call that there is a sequence of implicit conversions and there you go, that is what it does. This operation is kind of, kind of the, 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 the crux of move. When you turn a loan sample, a valid loan sample into proxy, you steal its resources, you make this resource equal to 0 and you push that in into this resource, it is just a simple pointer, nothing, nothing more than that and you return that, very lightweight operation and you pass that here and it simply assumes whatever, whatever value it had. So, through this conversion actually is the same thing that is happening here, there is a named variable and you turn it into a proxy calling this and turn it back into loan samples using this and you return that. So, it is it's just spelled out, but because the way it is arranged, primarily because this is private, these public operations, now you have much stronger and safer move, move, uh, what is the right word, um, object or you know class, move aware or move only I should say, it is a move only type, you cannot really copy. You do not get these semantics with standard shared pointer, thank you. This makes sense in case of uh, generic code, you know, uh, in some generic code you have assignments, you do not know what type it is using. If it happens to be loan samples, it is not going to compile, because unless you explicitly write move, it is not just not going to work. And kind of the same principle applies when you, when you have a function that returns, you create one, you have to move it out of the function. And same goes for sync, if you want to call 
call sync, you really have to say, well, yeah, move this inside. I know what I am doing. Without that, it is going to fail to compile. So, you have to explicitly say what you want to do, because this is destructive, right? Once it goes inside, um, it, the, the original has default state, which is equivalent to null pointer in this implementation. So, the state of this is well defined after that, but it is unusable. I mean, it has forgotten what it had completely. Uh, does that make sense? Any question on this so far? So, that actually took care of, uh, we do not allocate, right? I mean, in this particular implementation, there is hardly anything going on. No allocation, nothing. It just works pretty seamlessly. And in fact, I like that you have to write move, because it is explicit. And that takes care of it. It is, it is perfectly, you know, usable after once you get, you receive it, you can call begin and end to use your regular STL operations, STL algorithms. Only limitation uh, in C plus plus O3 is that you cannot use this type to create a vector, because it does not know what assignment is. Just like you cannot use an auto pointer in C plus plus O3 in, in a vector. But uh, that is ok. Uh, we provide another class called share samples. You turn this loan samples into a shared one. It is just like turning a auto pointer into a shared pointer, same idea here. And then you can use uh, vectors to your, to your heart's content. But of course, when you do this, now you do an allocation of that little reference count. But now it is up to the programmer. Do I really want this? If you do not, you do not pay, pay the cost for uh, you know, creating a, a reference count. So, in our case, with this uh, shared pointer, well, this um, um, boo constructor idiom really helped us quite a bit to kind of get what we wanted with practically no uh, effect on, on the interface, really clean interface with clean semantics. All right. So, in last, uh, unfortunately, well, I have 10 minutes, maybe I need 15 minutes to go through remaining sets of slides, uh, but we are, we are approaching the you know, end of my presentation. Um, we, we do some special provisions for C++ 11. Well, when we started work on this back in 2008, C++ 11 did not exist. So, we could not really commit to C++ 11 at that time. But when we finalized, that was end of last year, clearly C++ 11 was there. There were questions, which C++ are you supporting? So, we thought, yes, maybe we can do some um, syntax compatible extensions support those for those who use C++ 11 environment. It is not very many, but there are some kind of important ones. Well, the first thing is, we do not need to use this idiomatic way of using loan samples. We could just use first class smooth semantics, R value references to implement this. That is the first uh, provision that uh, is not mandatory. You could use it. It makes sense to use it for the implementers. Uh, well, we have some uh, free functions to make uh, loan samples work seamlessly with range based for loops. This begin, end are sort of the namespace level functions that come along with loan samples and shared samples. So, you can actually iterate over your samples in a, in a range based for loop. So, as long as you have begin and end and it has iterator semantics, this will work seamlessly. Um, the DDS array is a template for standard array, um, uh, template alias actually, it is the same as that. In C++ 3 is the identical API it kind of behaves just like it, but here is just an alias, as simple as that. One more idiom that we found really useful, you know, uh, in C++ 11 is type safe enumerations. In fact, all QoS policies, for example, durability here, there are these, uh, well, maybe I should use this example, C++ 11. All these uh, kind of enumerations are strongly typed. And that is why um, you can step away from the issues of good old enumerations, which are sort of you know scoping issues and some really funky expressions it, it participates in, you know, in Boolean context when you want a Boolean result. This takes care of it. But how about C plus plus O3? Because we ideally we want to make this transition, those who implement C plus plus O3 today, tomorrow the, this application wants to move to C plus plus eleven we want to lessen the uh, the burden of you know syntax changes 
So, in fact, we can get very close to uh, the semantics of um, types of enumerations in C++ O3 using, well, an idiom by the same name. Um, I am not going to details of it uh, today. You can look it up uh, by just, you know, types of enumeration idiom. But what it really does is uh, a template that uh, uh, allows, you know, scoping of these, uh, these constants as well as uh, it makes a separate type. So, you know, each safe enum this becomes a separate type and that is why uh, you get kind of type safety. Um, uh, maybe I am jumping too ahead, but um, the idea is for each enumeration you create a different type by instantiating this and you also provide, uh, you know, comparison operators uh, equal to, not equal to, uh, all that stuff. As a result of that, is syntax compatible types of enumerations. So, this is how you scope it as well as use the internal constant. Uh, earlier enumerations would you, ju you would just use keep all, that is all. There is no scoping here. Um, so, the, this idiom uh, allows us to achieve both, uh, achieve that in C plus plus O3 environment. Any questions on this so far? Thank you. The comment was, it is a very good idea <laughs> and I said thank you. <laughs> okay. um, so, just uh, touching upon this another standard at OMG object management group, uh, ideal to C++ 11 mapping, um, uh, Jeff brought it up uh, a while ago. Um, this is really a new mapping defined independent of CORBA of ideal to C++ 11 particularly. You could use this technically to, you know, this generator, generator, generator that implements this on the API, the DDS API that is defined in IDL and you will get something C++ with using some C++ 11 features. But of course, you are not going to get loan samples. I do not think the generator can automatically uh, resolve your exception safety issues just like that. Uh, you, you are not going to get uh, the selector, you know. The selector is a really nice way of separating out what you want to read from how you want to read. All these kind of really nice capabilities that we baked in into the, I mean, it's just, it's basically, it, it cannot replace human intelligence, as simple as that. You know, you, you do not get uh, overlaid operators. So, many things that, that are really useful and interesting improve readability in kind of human designed API. You are not going to get those if you just do direct generation of C++ 11 bindings for DDS. So, this is really a suboptimal solution um, and I want to put it out there, you know, this is not the way to go. You still need DDS, the PISM, the C++ binding. It is not making our earlier effort, four or five years effort redundant. It is in fact quite inferior. You could do that though, uh, if you need for some, uh, some reason. Well, um, this is pretty much the last slide, I think. The, the user defined types, right? Uh, I showed you the radar track data. The, those types in C++ 11 environment can use certain language features. I just want to quickly um, touch upon this specific idiom. Um, this is a constructor. In C++ O3 environment, you would pass const references for these. But in C++ 11, I think it makes sense to pass them by value. The reason is, first of all, all these parameters here, uh, we know what is allowed in IDL. IDL has either the, the basic types, the strings, the sequence that becomes a vector, all these are movable types, we know that in C++ 11 and move is really fast in those cases, not the array though, uh, so array has an exception. What we do here, instead of, uh, um, so first of all, you, you make a copy first of all, obviously, but that is the intent, right? It is a constructor, it really wants to make a copy. So, instead of making a copy inside the initializer list, it does it at the boundary of the function itself and we will see why that is important. 
at the boundary of the function, it makes copies of all these and inside is just going to move all of them to the, to the members. We know for sure that it's a, it's going to make a copy and that's why this works, not in general cases and constructor is a classic example of that. By making this by value, now you open very interesting optimization for the compiler. If one of these uh, parameters happens to be R value reference, uh, R values actually, you know, a temporary coming from a function, the compiler is smart enough to even move construct these. So, you are not even making a copy in case of at the boundary of the function. Now, you, an alternative to, to that is make all of them R value references and what that what that actually turns out to be, you really need 2 raised to 4, 16, right, R value references, you know. This could be R value reference, those may not be. This two could be R value references, those may not be. You need to spell out all 16 combinations and that is really the most optimal way. Well, if you have 10 parameters, good luck with that. Well, again, it is generated code. So, well, you could generate 2 raised to 10 constructors, I guess that is not impossible or unheard of maybe, but I think that is really unnecessary and it is kind of really elegant how you pay this cost of extra move which is a copy of a pointer. I think that is uh, worth it compared to having uh, you know 2 raised to the exponential number of constructors. So, I go into details of this in my another representation that I did last year in code camp. So, you could go and just google if you are interested in how this works and few other C plus plus idioms at my code camp presentation. So, this is what we kind of borrow from ideal to C plus plus 11 specification. This is specified. In fact, now it is really implementation dependent because there are really two ways to do this, right. We do not want to constrain vendors to really every single time use this because the most optimal way theoretical is to have exponential number of constructors. We do not want vendors to not use that. If in some certain cases it makes sense to do that, go ahead, be happy, you know, happily you can do that, but uh, I think this is a practical way. Uh, so, this idea is, this is what we borrow from, from I to C plus plus 11 by, by just you know uh, using that specification. So, in if you if your radar type or you know your uh, sensor data and you are using you are, you are declaring it like this you use the generator you will get these kind of uh, uh, nice optimizations uh, that are baked into the specification and i guess that's pretty much it so if you have some more questions you can uh, of course talk to me uh, i had my contact information on the first slide and the the slides are actually ha I had m many more slides than this uh, to fit it in uh, you know right 90 minutes and really keep keep my breath really uh, I cut down probably 10 or 15 of those uh, online you will get the full set of slides a uh, few other interesting uh, uh, tidbits on uh, entity QoS and uh, reference counting you know how we could uh, make how do we use in fact we do not use shared pointers because uh, to keep up to keep the life cycle of entities. We have to do much more than what shared pointer does because we want to keep the objects uh, around. So, those are kind of things I have described. Um, if you are interested, I can talk about it now or uh, you can go online and uh, take a look uh, when those these slides are available. Well, other than that, thank you very much and that is this concludes my talk. Any questions, comments? Good question. So the question is: um, um, Is this uh, is this middleware scalable? Um, is this open source? Uh, you know, what's really what's out there in the world, sort of. So, RTI, uh, we provide a commercial implementation of this. We have 
license we license this we also have open community source uh, we, we provide you the source code for this uh, there is a different license for that there are also open source implementations of dds um, at least i'm aware of at least two implementations and well i mean uh, whether it scales or not is really an implementation quality you know um, it really depends you want to scale in what dimension right um, so it's really there, there is no cut and dry answer for this yes or no uh, but one thing is for sure uh, vendors you know vendors compete on scalability so that's their value proposition so you really have to compare um, uh, each uh, offering so to speak does that answer your question yes So the question is whether RTI has uh, implemented it or what's the status? Uh, we are implementing it. Um, it's not released yet. Uh, we, uh, it's not. I mean, don't uh, quote me on this, but it should be uh, later this year. Um, if everything goes well, uh, that's that's our uh, that's the plan. I I hope so. Yeah. Right. Uh, thanks for coming.